All right, this is the podcast for Chapter 6 for AP Bio Part 2. Um, we're, we did the beginning with ATP, and now we're going to talk about enzymes. Enzymes are proteins, and we learned all about proteins in Chapter 3. Um, the enzymes are also catalysts, and that means that they enormously speed up chemical reactions. Um, most enzymes have an ASE ending to their name. For example, these are all enzymes, hexokinase, Catalase, which is the enzyme we're going to use in our lab, for enzyme lab. Peptidase and mutase are all examples of enzymes, and they all end in that ASE, so they're easily recognizable. Enzymes are not changed during a reaction. They are the same before the reaction and after the reaction. During the reaction, they will change shape slightly, but they will always go back to their original shape. Enzymes, key and most important part is what they do is they lower the activation energy. What that means is that, act, well, activation energy is the energy that is needed to start a chemical reaction. Enzymes lower that energy, so that means that the chemical reaction can go faster. Um, enzymes do not add energy. They do not remove energy from any chemical reactions. Enzymes do not change the equilibrium for a reaction, and enzymes can be reused over and over again. Okay. Um, activation energy is abbreviated E with subscript A. It is the energy that's required to break the bonds to start a chemical reaction. So if on this graph here is free energy, the energy that's available, and this is time. Okay. So in the red, this is the, how the reaction would go if you did not have an enzyme. It would require this much free energy, and that amount that's required is called activation energy if you did not have an enzyme. It needs this much energy, and then it can proceed. If you do have an enzyme right here in the gray or blue line, it cut that energy in half. It lowered the activation energy. It only needs half, pretty much half the amount. So the chemical reaction can go at a faster rate. When enzymes work, um, they actually work and act upon a substrate. Substrates are just a fancy word for a reactant. Um, Enzymes will actually form a complex with their substrate. It's a non-covalent kind of bond between the enzyme and the substrate, and it's called the ES complex, and this occurs at the active site on the enzyme. When the enzyme complex breaks up, the product of the chemical reaction will be released. Um, this is What this is called is the induced fit model. The enzyme will actually conform to the shape of the substrate, or the substrate will conform to the shape of the enzyme. So there is a slight changing of shape of these molecules. This induces strain on the substrate structure and allows the chemical reaction to occur. All right, so here's our enzyme, this white Pac-Man looking thing. And this, these grooves right here that are very specific are, is called the active site. So right here is the active site. This blue thing is our substrate. The substrate binds to a specific enzyme. Enzymes are made for specific substrates. And when that binding occurs, that is called the ES complex. And a little bit of you know, shape changes. And the reaction occurs, and then the products will be released. Here's an example of one taken under an um, electron microscope. This is hexokinase in blue here. And this is an example of induced fit. Here is our substrate. The substrate is going to go and bind to the enzyme hexokinase at the active site, which is these grooves right here. When that occurs, the induced fit occurs, the substrate chain might conform to the enzyme, and it looks like the enzyme definitely conformed around to the substrate. So when the chemical reaction occurs, and then the product will be released, and this enzyme will come back after the reaction looking exactly like it did at the beginning. Okay, so on a diagram, you should be able to uh, label um, you should know where the enzyme is. Okay, the enzymes always have specific grooves. You should know the substrates are going to go and bind to the enzyme at the active site. When it binds to the enzyme, the substrates bind to the enzyme. It's called the enzyme substrate complex. And that is when the induced fit occurs and it changes shape slightly. Chemical reaction occurs and then we have products being released. Okay, and then notice our enzyme at the end of the reaction looks exactly, well, this is hand drawn but is available again to do some catalytic activity. So this process here is called the catalytic cycle of an enzyme. 
All right, components of an enzyme. We know enzymes are proteins, um, but they actually do have some other components involved. Um, so this is really a, a vocabulary thing here. Apoenzyme is specifically referring to the protein part of an enzyme. Cofactors are inorganic, and they're usually ions like calcium or magnesium. Um, so when you take the apoenzyme, the protein part, and you take the ions with that, that's what makes up an active enzyme. Now, you can have organic components as well. If they're organic cofactors instead of inorganic, then the name changes to coenzyme. Okay, coenzymes. We already learned about coenzymes. These are examples. Vitamins are coenzymes. That's why it's important to take your vitamins every day because they are actually enzymes that are used in metabolism in your body. ATP is considered a coenzyme. NADH and FADH2 are also coenzymes. Coenzyme A, which we'll talk about next unit, is a coenzyme. All right, there are different groups that enzymes fall in, or classes, I should say, um, and depending on what their job is. So enzymes that do redox reactions are in the class oxidoreductases. And notice all of these groups are ending in ASE. Enzymes that transfer functional groups from donors to receptor molecules are called transferases. Enzymes that have a role in hydrolysis reactions are called hydrolases. Ones that convert from one isomer to another are called isomerases. Ones that join two molecules together, ligases, and lyases is when they're breaking bonds. Okay, so all enzymes will fit into these general categories. All right, the next concept we need to talk about is that enzymes are very sensitive. And this is kind of what our AP lab coming up is um, about. Um, each enzyme, okay, has an optimal temperature, the best temperature that they work their best at, the fastest rate, um, an optimal pH and ionic strength, okay, that they work their best in. Human enzymes, as you can see on the graph, are optimized to work at body temperature, which is roughly 37 degrees Celsius. And that's normal body temperature. But enzymes, for example, that are in bacteria that can tolerate heat work best at high temperatures, like 75 you know, degrees. Um, body enzymes, enzymes that are in the body for digestion, have a certain pH that they work best at. Pepsin, for example, works best at pH of 2, which is a very acidic environment like our stomach, and that's where you would find pepsin. Trypsin is found in the intestine, which is more of a basic, so it works best at pH of 8. So every enzyme have these special, you know, optimal numbers, okay? What happens if you go over that? If you have higher temperatures than the enzyme can work at, um, higher temperatures is going to denature the enzyme. The enzyme is going to change shape. It's not going to function anymore, and you can't reverse that. Same thing with pH. If pH is altered, enzymes are going to become inactive, and it's not reversible. So when you get a fever, it's, that's why it's such a big deal. Um, when you get acid, for example, like thrown at your face or something, that's, it's a big deal. Enzymes are becoming inactive and it's dangerous. All right, what, another concept we need to talk about is enzyme inhibition. Um, there are two types, competitive and non-competitive. For competitive inhibition, if you see in the picture here in part A in your book, there is an inhibitor molecule involved, okay? The inhibitor can bind to the active site right here. And when that happens, it's competing basically for that active site. And so when it's bonded there, the substrates can't bond because this is in the way. And obviously the chemical reaction would not occur. Competitive inhibition is when the inhibitor is competing for the active site. For non-competitive inhibition, the inhibitor is binding to the enzyme, just like in competitive, but it's not competing for the active site. It's non-competitive. It is binding to an alternate site that's away from the active site, okay? But what happens is once it does that, it changes the shape of the enzyme and that, cha that entail changes the shape of the active site. And so then the active, or the substrates can't bind because it doesn't match anymore and the reactions will not occur. So competitive is when it competing directly for the active site. Non-competitive is when it's binding, the inhibitor is binding to the non-active site. Um, another concept is called allosteric control. If a substance binds to an allosteric site, and then we just learned about allosteric sites. Allosteric sites are sites that are not 
the active site. So over here, that's an allosteric site. Here's your active site. When that happens, an inhibitor bonds to the allosteric site, the conformation of the active site is changed, and I just went over this, and that affects the enzyme activity. And so the inact that enzyme is inactive because that inhibitor is bound to the allosteric site. So sometimes you need another molecule, like cyclic AMP, for example, would bond to the inhibitor, releasing it off the enzyme. The enzyme would bounce right back to its original shape. The substrate can bond, and then we have our complex, and the chemical reaction occurs. So this is called allosteric control. You can control your enzymes in your body this way by having something in your body binding here that's controlling whether the, the, those reactions are occurring and making substances and products like in your body. Um, regulating is very important for enzymes. So for example, imagine a series of enzyme-mediated reactions, which is the way bi chemistry and you know, biology really works. And here is um, reaction A makes reaction B using enzyme 1. B, product B makes you know, product C using enzyme 2. C makes D using 3, and D makes F using 4. Okay? Um, the products or the reactants of any of the reactions can have an effect on later on, you know, later reactions and the enzymes that are involved later. Um, if an enzyme is turned off, so if E2 is turned off, then that's going to affect, you know, the products of C. So if an enzyme is turned off by its products, then it's called feedback inhibition. Um, so for example, F might block B and C from occurring. And if that happens, then obviously C and D are going to be lowered and not made as much. So if an enzyme is turned on, then, you know, the reactions would occur and things can be stimulated in the body. Um, the homeo this maintains homeostasis in our body, and it's regulated by turning on and turning off these enzymes. Okay. Um, this is an example. 309 is an enzyme that makes alpha-ketobutyrate. But isoleucine, which is made after all of these reactions, inhibits this enzyme. So the more isoleucine there is, the less of this enzyme is it is going to be. So this is controlling this first reaction. And so if that's controlling this, then obviously all of these different reactions are not going to occur. And I believe that is the end of